Okay, let's, uh, let's get started. Uh, before we jump back to our discussion about active categorical perception, uh, any questions about assignment six? Adding joints to connect together the body parts making up our robot. So far, so good? Okay. All right, so last time we were talking about uh, the fifth and final building block of cognition in this series of minimal cognition experiments that we've been looking at. We looked last time at distinguishing between self and non-self. We looked at memory. We looked at detecting uh, affordances. We looked at selective attention, deciding what to pay attention to when. And last time we, were look, we finished by talking about this not-so-minimal robot that tackles the issue of forming categories in the world, right? We have a continuous uh, flow of sensation that's coming in. How do we chunk that continuous flow of information into discrete things? How do we learn or evolve the ability to distinguish between friend and foe, danger and opportunity, familiar and unfamiliar, and so on, right? Clearly one of the, the fundamental pieces of acting intelligently in the world, where does this come from? Well, we looked at uh, a robotic approach to this problem of categorization by focusing on the active or embodied approach to categorization. If I want to learn about the categories that exist out there in the world, one good way to get started is to literally manipulate objects out there and learn that there are certain similarities between some objects and differences between them. So we were looking at this experiment uh, where a robot was evolved to do this. As we saw last time, it's got an arm and a relatively complex uh, hand. It has a relatively complex C tier and N. We looked at this last time. Uh, it has, however, a familiar form. We've got our sensors, hidden nodes, uh, motor outputs, and we ended last time by talking about these two special output neurons which are used for categorization. Right? So at every time step that the robot is moving or interacting with an object, we're looking at the values of neurons 47 and 48. And as I drew for you on the board last time, we're plotting the two values of 47 and 48 as they change over time. And as they do, that draws a trajectory in this phase diagram. So the robot is manipulating the sphere or the ellipsoid. 47 and 48 is changing. How do we enable the robot to distinguish between spheres and ellipsoids? So we introduced this idea last time of putting a rectangle around the trajectory produced by 47 and 48 in the presence of one object. And then putting a larger bounding box, C sub S, around all the rectangles produced when the robot is in the presence of the sphere. So remember that we know when the robot is in the presence of a sphere. It doesn't know that yet. We know, so we can draw CS. We also draw a second bounding box, C sub D, around all the rectangles produced by the trajectories of neuron 47 and 48 when the robot is in the presence of the ellipsoid. Right? So we have these two bounding boxes, CS and CD, and now we're going to take those bounding boxes, and for every C tier and N, we're going to expose that C tier and N to 16 objects, or 16 environments, which is going to give us these two rectangles, for, or these two bounding boxes for each C tier and N, and we use them to compute the fitness of that C tier and F. So we finished last time by looking at the fitness function for this particular experiment, which is made up of two terms, F1 and F2. And we finished last time by working our way through them. F1 selects for robots that keep contact with the object. The palm is always touching the object in some way. Note that it's the distance between the palm and the object. The fitness function says nothing about what the fingers and the thumb are doing, or what the angle of the arm is for that, that matter, right? Just contact the object. How you manipulate it, that's up to you. The second term is looking at these bounding boxes, and the second term selects for what? 
What are we looking for in terms of these two boxes? We don't want them to overlap, right? So on the negative side here, this negative term on the numerator, we've got the area of intersection between them, right? And we would like to minimize this. If this intersection is 0, 1 minus 0 is 1, and we maximize F2, right? The term on the, uh, the, term on the denominator here is normalizing, right? So we, we just make sure that the term on the right-hand side there, that ratio, always goes between 0 and 1. Do we care about the size of the bounding boxes? Do we care about how far apart they are, their relative positions? No, right? There's none of that in there. Just minimize intersection. OK. So as promised, now we're going to have a look at some of these actual evolved C tier and ends. They use this fitness function. They evolved the robot to do so. And I apologize on the quality. It might be a little bit difficult to see here. I'm going to play the video for you, and we're going to watch one evolved CTRNN, like we've seen before. One evolved CTRNN played multiple times, and we're going to place either the sphere or the ellipsoid under the robot's palm. And you'll notice there's a little blue arrow here, and the arrow starts by pointing up. So the robot is not sure what, whether it's the sphere or the ellipsoid. As the video starts to play, you're going to see that the arrow is either going to move and point to sphere or to ellipsoid. How did the investigators figure out when the robot is sure that it's in the presence of a sphere or an ellipsoid? Remember, we're playing back one evolved CTRNN. What are they pulling out of the CTRNN to know that the robot knows, again, quote unquote, that it's a sphere or an ellipsoid? How is the robot going to tell us which of the two it is? Since there are many boxes, I guess, around the spheres or ellipsoids, uh, so I guess if we can find that the box is not a sphere, then the first thing is the, the but if the box is a cube, it's a sphere. Yeah. Sorry, can you say that again? If the box is not a cube, it's an ellipsoid. If it is a cube, it's a sphere. So it's not the shape of the box. We're not looking for a cube. What are we looking for? Remember that we're defining these. Remember these boxes that sit inside the overall bounding box for either the sphere or the ellipsoid. So we give the robot a new object after we've evolved, uh, evolved the CTRNN. We give it a new object and say, OK, we turn on the robot. All right, robot, tell us, is this a sphere or an ellipsoid? How does it tell us? It will get the value of the categorization neurons. And if they're inside the box for a sphere, we're saying that the robot said it's a sphere. If it's in the box for an ellipsoid, we're saying that the robot said it's an ellipsoid. Exactly. So we turn on the robot and we watch neurons 47 and 48. 47 and 48 are going to start to change values, which means they're going to start to draw a trajectory inside the phase diagram, right? And if that trajectory wanders inside to this rectangle, CS, that's the robot saying, aha, this is a sphere. If the trajectory wanders inside CD, the robot says, aha, that's an ellipsoid. So at the beginning, the blue rectangle is pointing up, meaning the robot doesn't know, it doesn't know whether it's a sphere or an ellipsoid. What's the value of 47 and 48 at, that, at the first time step of the evaluation period? Zero, zero. Zero, zero. It's not inside either of the boxes, right? So if the values of 40, neurons 47 and 48 are outside both of those bounding blocks, the robot says, I can feel something touching my palm, but I have no idea what it is yet, right? So how is the robot going to figure out? What, it's going to move, right? Somehow it's going to start to manipulate the object, and as it moves, the motor neurons send values to the motors, the, the hand starts to move. When the hand moves, because we have an embodied agent, 
The sensor values are going to start to change. Sensor values influence the motor neurons, or the hidden neurons. The hidden neurons influence the motor neurons, and they also influence the categorization neurons. 47 and 48 will start to change. OK, so watch carefully. See if this will play in. No, it won't play in the slide. Hold on. All right, here we go. Okay, how did the robot do? Pretty well, right? Again, the sphere and the ellipse are pretty close to one another, right? It's almost hard to see from the video which, which, is, which is which. Pretty well. You'll notice if you go back and watch this video on your own time that the robot actually makes the decision, again, quote unquote, uh, at different times. Sometimes it, it figures out earlier and sometimes it figures out later which one it is. What strategy has this particular CTRNN evolved to distinguish between spheres and ellipsoids? Uh, could we play back the example where it's an ellipse? Yep. Remember, some of the ellipsoids are placed at different angles, right, under the palm. My arm is like rolling it. It's rolling it, so you can see some obvious things. It's rolling both objects, though, right? How is it distinguishing between these? Do you have an idea? Could it possibly be the joint in the wrist and how that moves? Yeah, that is probably part of it, right? So if you watch carefully, there's something about the angle of the wrist that's different. Very tricky though, right? There's a little bit there. Uh, it seems to be distinguishing spheres quicker than ellipses. Okay, that might be. Um, so like the ease of rolling right from the get-go. And maybe the time? Maybe that's what I'm wondering, you know, how is it? If it was a sphere and it came out exactly the same, a sphere, if it moved in exactly the same way, it would always be the same amount of time. Or angle. It could be, but remember it's, it's doing just one object, right? So it's not really comparing this to something else, but it might be something about the uniformity of the velocity of the joint angles, right? If, that, if the velocity is more or less the same, then maybe the shape is kind of more uniform. Who knows, right? This is it. You can watch this for hours if you want, right? It's very, very tricky to tell what exactly, what exact strategy the robot has hit upon that works, but clearly it does, it does work, right? Whatever the distinguishing thing this CTRNet has evolved to do is very subtle, right? Tricky to, to pull out, which is not surprising, right? The investigators made this pretty hard on the robot, right? These objects are very close to one another, but not exactly the, the same thing. Okay, um, there's also the same C to turn N played back at position B. Remember, they, they placed eight objects at position uh, A here, and then another one at position B. Robot does more or less the same thing. Is it fully understood why they got the results they did? So I mean, you're saying it's right. subtle. Do they actually fully understand why it shows? They do, at least they do not report it in the paper. So in my group, we've done some follow-up studies on, on this robot, and actually, and one, a student in this class actually tackled this problem. So you can, what you can then do, which wasn't done in this experiment, is take these movement patterns and apply a machine learning algorithm on top of it after the fact, right? So you can ask a machine learning algorithm to classify 
these movement patterns. Tell me what features of the movement. Is it the angle of the wrist? Is it the standard deviation of the velocity? Is it the uniformity of speed in which it rolls? What is it, right? Maybe it's six of these features in some complex combination that allows it to distinguish between these, these things. They didn't do that. We've done a little bit on that. It, it's exceedingly tricky, but not, not impossible. Okay. But again, if you now go back and redo another evolutionary run and evolve a new CTRNN that also succeeds in the presence of all 16 objects, it'll come up with a completely different solution, right? There's an infinite number of ways that you can manipulate this sphere and ellipsoid to discover through tactile, through touch, and through proprioceptive, the angles in your arm and hand that will distinguish between these, these objects. Okay. Let's just pause here for a moment and go back to, uh, go back to the neural network. Why did they go through this complicated way of enabling the robot to categorize the objects? They're much simpler things they could have done, right? So they have two different objects they want to distinguish between. They could have said if value, if neuron 47 has a larger value than 48, that means sphere. And if 47 is less than 48, that means ellipsoid. Why not? That's much simpler than these phase diagrams and bounding boxes. What's wrong with that? Because that way it's either a sphere or an ellipsoid, and there's no space in between, so there won't be a choice. That's true. Okay. Yeah, maybe that, that's that's part of the issue. Yeah. It totally limits like what you're going to be able to do. But if you put a it um, limits cube, it in what way? Well, if you put a cube in the robot's space, it would have a different phase uh, profile than either an ellipse or a circle. Exactly, right? So what happens if we present it with a cube? Or an ellipsoid which has a greater difference in the ratio between the major and the minor axes, right? So something that's more ellipsoid than the ones they used. What is the robot going to do? What if we wanted to train this robot not to distinguish between spheres and ellipsoids? There's a lot more categories out there in the world than just those two things. What if we wanted to distinguish between cubes, rectangular solids, soft objects, hard objects, with this simpler idea of just assigning one categorization neuron to each category, what's the problem? We've seen this problem already. It doesn't generalize well. It doesn't generalize well, right? So it's one of these things or not. But what's the other problem aside from just generalization? What if we wanted to categorize or distinguish between a hundred objects, or a thousand objects, or a million different kinds of objects. What if it's a robot? Maybe. So this is back to the generalization issue. What do we have to do to the neural network if we want if we want to assign a categorization ob object, categorization neuron to each object? <coughs> You need a million different neurons, right? This is the scalability issue we've seen before. This is a, a debate that continues to rage in neuroscience, right? How specialized is the human brain? Do you have different parts of your brain that recognize every single person you've ever met? Or is your brain categorizing familiar objects and people and things out in the world in a more sophisticated way? Presumably, the brain, there isn't a simple one-to-one -one mapping between the things that exist out in the world and little bits of neural tissue in, in the brain. That's not a very economical way to do things, right? The more categories you recognize, the more neural real estate you're going to, to need, right? So could we, could we get the robot to distinguish between three different objects using this phase diagram approach. How would that actually work? What would we need to change here to allow it to categorize three objects now rather than two? We present the robot with spheres, ellipsoids, and cubes now. It would be the same type of thing where we have three rectangles. 
Exactly, right? We still just have neurons 47 and 48, but now we create, we draw three bounding boxes, right? One around spheres, one around ellipsoids, and a third bounding box around cubes, and then alter our fitness function to minimize uh, overlap between any pair of the two bounding boxes, right? Distinguish between these three objects, or four objects, or five, or ten, or a thousand. Now, how many objects we could pack into this remains to be seen. No one's tried that yet. An idea for a final project there. Okay. Let's keep going. Uh, in the paper, at least, uh, they did three separate evolutionary runs, and they're plotting the best, the fitness of the best CTRNN in the population at generation one, two, and so on. So the familiar fitness curve we've seen many times before. The total value for the fitness function is 2. Remember, there's F1 and F2. Both of them range between 0 and 1, so the best you can do is 2. You can see that these two runs, it didn't take very long for the robot to successfully uh, evolve the ability to distinguish between spheres and ellipsoids. The third run, for whatever reason, it took a little bit longer, but eventually we got there as well. Okay. The other advantage of this uh, phase diagram approach to categorization is, as we saw by watching the video, it's very hard to see how the robot actually categorizes this. So a, a different way of trying to understand how the robot categorizes is to look at the phase diagrams themselves. It's not arbitrary that the investigators picked two neurons because that produces a two-dimensional phase diagram which we can easily plot and look at, right? So what are we looking at here? Well, again, we're looking at one evolved controller, one evolved CTRNN. Now they placed 180 spheres. Of course, it's all the same sphere. But they placed uh, 90 of them under the robot's palm in position A and 90 of them under the robot's palm at position B. And then they did the same thing with 180 rotations of the ellipsoid. So now they took the ellipsoid and placed it at 180 different uh, orientations, 90 of them under position A and 90 of them under position B. And this is what happened to neurons 47 and 48, right? So the phase diagram is beautiful because it gives us a window into the thinking of the robot. We don't have to pay attention to synaptic weights and all that other complexity or the angle of the, the elbow or velocities. We can just see it. And you can see immediately that there's some structure to the thinking of this robot. Let's start with CS, which is the dotted line, right? The bounding box. Anything inside CS here in the dotted line, the robot says, is a sphere. And anything inside C sub D here, the robot thinks is an ellipsoid. What can you tell me about these two bounding boxes? The sphere one's a lot smaller. The sphere one is a lot smaller. They're obviously not overlapping. That's what the fitness function selected for. Why is the, why is the sphere bounding box smaller? Remember the fitness function said nothing about the size of these bounding blocks, uh, bounding boxes. Well, depending on the start rotation of the ellipsoid, it's going to behave dif differently. But the sphere, you can rotate it with other ellipsoids. That's it, right? So the ellipsoid produces a wider range of sensor motor experiences for the robot, right? There's more different feeling that emerges from these 180 rotations of the ellipsoid than there is from the sphere, right? If we took an ellipsoid, again, that had a longer major axis and produced a third and trained it to understand that third category, we would probably get an even larger bounding box, right? So already, we can look inside the robot's mind and understand that from the robot's point of view, there's a richer set of experiences that correspond to ellipsoid. What else? Did it get every one of these 360 presentations correct? Not quite, right? 
Where did it make a mistake? And how did it make a mistake? How many mistakes did it make out of these 360? Well, there are definitely two mistakes that overlap with the sphere. And then there's that there's one here. there that's so what is this? Oh. What, what does this one represent? What does this mistake out here represent? It should be an ellipsoid, but it's not within the other box. It's, so this is an ellipsoid. Anything that's a black box here, that was an actual ellipsoid, right? And most of them fell within the robot's understanding of what an ellipsoid is, so that's good. But one of the ellipsoids is in neither box, which means... It doesn't know what it is. It doesn't know, right? It says, I, I don't know what this is. It's not a sphere. It's not an ellipsoid. I don't know, right? Okay, so 360 got one wrong. This one here is also outside both boxes, but it's also impinging a little bit on the sphere, right? So it's saying, well, I'm not quite sure, but it kind of feels like a sphere. It's not a sphere. This one, it says, yeah, this is probably a sphere. It's not a sphere, it's an ellipsoid. All right, three mistakes out of 360, not, not too bad, right? Not perfect, but, but okay. What else can you tell me about the robot's thinking here? You'll see these two clumps here. What do these two clumps represent? Exactly, position A and position B. But not all the boxes produced in position A and position B perfectly overlap one another. But in all 180 presentations of the sphere in position A, we're giving it exactly the same sphere in exactly the same position. Why is, the, why is it not perfect overlap here? There's a remaining detail of this experiment that I haven't mentioned, which you should be able to infer from this picture. Is there some noise in the sensors? There's a little bit of noise in the, the sensors and maybe the motor, right? So there's a little bit, the robot never does exactly the same thing twice, which is important, right? That it, in nature, your sensors are not 100% accurate, right? So there's a little bit of noise which causes a little bit of change in the values of 47 and, and 48, right? That's what those two clumps correspond to. What about down here? I don't see two clumps. It's a little harder to say what the robot is thinking about in this case. Okay, so let's pause there for a moment and let's take two minutes or so and I'd like you to turn to your neighbor and I'd like you to, to imagine that you have this experiment all ready to go on your machine and you now want to expand this experiment in certain ways. We already talked about ways to expand it to add objects, but how else could we use this to enrich the robot's understanding of the world out there, right? Not all categories are per, per, uh, perfectly distinct, right? There's overlapping categories. There's categories that are a continuum. This object is more soft. It's more, it's, uh, more hard. It's darker. It's brighter. It's what have you. So think about this. Talk, turn, turn, turn to your neighbor and talk about ideas about how you would go about changing the neural network and or the fitness function to enrich the robot's ability to categorize. Okay, go ahead. I'll give you a couple of minutes. We'll see what you came up with. Yeah. 
Okay, how can we uh, amp up the cognitive abilities of, of this robot? Um, so we could try to add um, degrees of sense to the fingers because like... What do you mean by degrees of sense? Well, right now when it's touching, it's just touching. Um, yep. But if you had something granular like sand, it would be like, I'm still touching, I'm still touching. You know, there would be no way to understand softness. I see, right. So the tactile sensors here are binary, right? Either something is touching the fingertip or it's not. Yeah. There's actually some exciting research going on in terms of robot skin, right? Okay. So skin is one of, uh, one of our best sensors, right? We tend to focus on our visual sense, but skin is amazing, right? It gives you pressure, so yeah. how much force is acting on the fingertip, uh, texture, friction, all sorts of things, right? Temperature, maybe we could amp up the, sen the sensorium of the robot which would allow it to form more kinds of categories like, you were just mentioning sand, right? I don't even know how we'd like, be able to tell though, because like every single time, you're like, what is this? Perhaps, right? Remember baby bot that was manipulating the fruit, yeah. right? It could sort of distinguish between things that were hard and, and soft, right? Maybe, maybe more sophisticated sensation in the hand might allow it to distinguish between things that are malleable or siftable or made up of lots of small pieces. Who, who knows? Other ideas? Different sizes, right, absolutely. We, have, we were just saying something about shape here. So they're different, obviously different objects have different categories, right? Shape, size, uh, material properties. Maybe we could add that in. What else? Okay, we could, maybe we need to increase the dimensionality of the phase diagram, right? As I mentioned, no one's really looked at that. How many categories can you pack into this two-dimensional approach? As the, the number and relationship between categories gets more complex, at what point might we have to increase the dimensionality of the phase diagram? If we go from a two-dimensional diagram to a three-dimensional diagram, that allows bounding boxes to have more neighbors. We haven't really talked about this, right? The sphere and the ellipsoid categories are neighboring one another here. And obviously, if you're in two dimensions, you can only have so many neighbors. What would neighboring bounding boxes kind of mean from the robot's point of view? They're similar types of objects. Similar types of objects, right? So if we want to have lots of similar relationships between things, we might have to go up to a higher dimension. So while we're on the topic of similarity, that's obviously important, right? Not all categories are equally independent. Certain categories kind of belong together. So there's a hierarchy to categories as well, right? Horse belongs to animal, animal belongs to the category organism, organism belongs to the category of animate things. How could we change this experiment to allow the robot to build up an understanding of hierarchical categories? These are spheres and ellipsoids, but they belong to the, the larger class of round objects. And all these round objects are distinct from edged objects, which contains knives and cubes and all sorts of other things. How would we add in hierarchical categorization here? 
you kept with this idea of bounding boxes, you could have like these separate bounding boxes like this for the sphere and the ellipsoid, and then build a bigger bounding box around it that was for bound objects. Exactly. And you could have another bounding box for uh, sharp cornered objects, and you would want those, the round object and the sharp cornered bounding boxes to be separate, or like you would want sphere and ellipsoid to be within the round object. Exactly, right? We have a hierarchy of bounding boxes. We draw a larger bounding box around the sphere and ellipsoid bounding box, and that bigger bounding box, that's going to be round objects, right? And then a bigger one for edged objects. So a hierarchy of bounding boxes for hierarchical organization of, of categories. Right? And again, hopefully if we do this in the right way, we should be able to look at a snapshot of a robot that successfully figured out how to hierarchically categorize objects, and we can see at a glance how well it's doing and where it's failing. Okay, so that's why I talk about this experiment in this class. It's a, it's a great experiment, but it's just the beginning of a much bigger picture. So for those of you that are interested in categorization, this might be something to tackle in your final project. Okay, so that concludes lecture 10 on active categorical perception. And it also concludes our discussion of minimal cognition. We've looked at a bunch of experiments now where they've evolved robots that exhibit important pieces of intelligence. And it also concludes uh, our discussion of the early days of evolutionary robotics. And we're going to switch now to sort of a parallel track of research that's gone on uh, in the field of evolutionary robotics. And we're going to look at this in two lectures about locomotion. I can't remember if I mentioned this at the beginning of class, uh, but there was a, a famous neuroscientist who asked the question, why don't plants have brains? Did, you, did I tell you this already? Yeah. You heard this, right? So what's the answer? They don't, have they don't have to move, right? So there's something about cognition or intelligence that is ultimately rooted in having to solve the problem of how to get from point A to point B. If you need to move around in the world, the moment you move, all of your sensation is changing, right? This is a pretty non-trivial problem. So a lot of research in robotics goes into understanding locomotion, and in a lot of cases, the focus is on legged locomotion. All right, so we'll talk about legged locomotion in lecture 11, and then uh, next week in lecture 12, we'll focus on our particular kind of locomotion. Did you have a question? Sort of. It was yep. The idea of needing a brain to have cognition. Yes. How do animals like jellyfish evolve that? Uh, they have brains. They're much simpler than, than ours, however. Right. So whether you need a brain to be smart, that is a very interesting discussion in and of its own right. We're not going to tackle that, that here. For our purposes, all of our robots are going to have, have brains. But there may be ways to get around intelligently in the world without explicit neural tissue. OK. Good, good point. OK. So uh, lecture 12, we're going to sort of have a crash course in uh, terrestrial locomotion, how to get around uh, on land, how to get how Mother Nature has solved the problem, how to get from point A to point B is a fascinating subject in and of its own right. First few slides here are taken from the table of contents of Alexander's uh, biomechanics Bible called The Principles of Animal Locomotion. As a roboticist, this is one of my absolute favorite books. I'll pass it around. You can sort of glance through it. Uh, it's a beautiful book if you're interested in, in this issue of how animals move and how to get robots to move. I definitely suggest you pick up a copy of this book. As I mentioned, it's my favorite book, so make sure I get it back at the end of, of lecture. Okay. Uh, as you can see from the table of contents, uh, Alexander arranged his discussion ar starting with very, very simple things. How do you actually do it using muscle? And then he gradually marches through all the different ways that nature has solved this problem. And throughout this discussion, it becomes very clear that Mother Nature is, sol is trying to solve or, or strike a balance between these, two, these four competing issues, which are absolutely important if you're an animal or a robot trying to, to get along in the real world. You need to get from point A to point B, so that's displacement. You may need to travel far 
A, B may be very far from A, or you may need to travel very fast, right? There may be a predator behind you, and there's a safe zone at, at B. So displacement, for our purposes, this is how far you need to travel or how fast you need to travel. You need to be able to travel robustly, right? How many different kinds of terrain can you get across? Energy, how much energy does it require for any particular distance you travel? And finally, stability, right? As you move, especially if you're a legged animal or a legged robot, you need to maintain your balance as you travel from point A to point B. Unfortunately, Mother Nature and we have not yet figured out how to maximize all four of these things. Typically, when you improve one, you hurt the other. And we're going to see some of these trade-offs in a moment. What are some obvious differences in robotics between these different trade-offs? Okay, so the energy source for robots is going to be different from animals. Think about all the robots you've seen in videos or, or movies or what have you. Think about how those robots get around. How are they striking different balances between these four things? Well, lots of robots that you see in this around have to be raised or something because it's very fast and a great energy efficient way to travel. Very fast, very energy efficient, absolutely. So wheels are great. You see them on a lot of robots, but... This kind of terrain gives they need to be going robust. They need to climb things uh, that trees or cliffs. Can not not very robust, right? Trees or cliffs are kind of off limits if you're a wheeled robot. If you're a legged robot, on the other hand, and this is why roboticists tend to focus on legged locomotion, right? We want machines that can traverse rough terrain. What's the problem there? Not very fast. Not very fast, right? So an obvious trade-off between wheels and legs in. Uh, robots. Um, a student last year built a wagged robot. So a wagged robot is a robot that has both wheels and legs. Again, an interesting idea for a final final project. Okay, back to back to animals for a moment. Uh, Alexander starts out in chapter six with peristaltic motion. We're actually going to see this later in the course. Very very simple solution. If you're soft and you can expand and contract different parts of your body, you can actually create traveling waves of volumetric change along your body, which translates into movement in the opposite direction. You also use peristalsis for, for swallowing. This is a common hack that Mother Nature found a long time ago and has built into a lot of different systems, some of them for locomotion. These we're pretty familiar with, walking, running, and hopping. Climbing and jumping, brachiation, the fancy term for swinging from limb, uh, limb to limb. I showed you a brachiating robot already. Crawling and burrowing, so moving through relatively dense material. There's certain, there's big energy issues there. Gliding and soaring, so now we get into air uh, transport. Hovering, powered forward flight, moving on the surface of water, swimming with oars and hydrofoils swimming by undulation, you name it, right? Mother Nature has figured out how to get animals from point A to point B in a lot of different uh, environments. This is uh, a puzzle I throw out for my grad students at the beginning of every semester. What can't uh, a snake do? Mother Nature uh, loves her one-dimensional animals. There's uh, very little that snakes can't do. They can climb just about any surface. But again, there's always a trade-off. Let's focus on locomotion for a moment. There's a trade-off, though, of course, if you're a one-dimensional animal or a one-dimensional robot. Can they not go backwards? Uh, possibly. A snake, some, most snakes can't, but we could build a snake robot that does. We could get it around that issue. Uh, well, you need friction. You, you don't see any snakes. I mean, obviously, they're cold-blooded, but you don't see any snakes. On ice. Dealing with ice. Yes, that's true. That's, that's a problem, right? So you need friction. You need to be able to push in a certain way against the ground. If you're using friction to move, remember this trade-off we just talked about. What are you failing at here in these four things if you're relying mostly on friction? Energy, right? So robustness if you can't move over ice, but if you're pushing against things and you're that's that's very energy inefficient. So if your body is dragging in any way, 
It's, it's inefficient. You're losing energy as, as heat. It's only horizontal movement, so you're moving along the plane. So uh, snakes and reptiles lie flat, right? But the, one of the biggest innovations in the mammalian form was for legs to become increasingly vertical. And the moment that that started to happen, there was an opportunity that opened up, which is the pendulum, right? So as we'll talk about this more when we talk about bipedal locomotion. When you leave the classroom today, pay attention to the muscle groups in your leg. When your leg is swinging forward, all of the muscles in your leg go limp for the short period until your heel strikes the ground and then you tense your muscles again. So your legs are literally taking a rest for every half of their cycle, right? Legged locomotion is energy efficient. Bipedal locomotion is extremely energy efficient for that, that reason. OK. OK, buoyancy, uh, some other things. Again, a great, great book for those of you interested in biomechanics. OK, so let's uh, look at a few figures from Alexander's book to motivate or, or build up an intuition for how this trade-off actually occurs in nature. Most of the experiments with animals have some form of VO2 max experiment. They put the animal on a treadmill, and they somehow are able to access the amount of oxygen that the animal is pulling out of the air as a function of how fast it's moving, right? We can put an animal or a human on a treadmill, speed up or slow down the treadmill, and see how much or how little oxygen they are burning. And we're going to use the amount of oxygen they burn at any time interval as a proxy for how much energy they're using uh, or the amount of power they're, they're actually using, the amount of power required to maintain that, that speed. So in these plots here, you've got some aspect of the gait or the way the animal is moving. And on the vertical axis, this is basically energy. So the higher on this, the more energy the robot or the animal is using to move. Let's start with question one over here. For a given gait, and this is again one of the interesting things about legged animals, we tend to move at discrete gaits, right? There isn't a continuum of ways in which we move. We can, but we typically choose not to, right? You walk at a certain speed and run at a certain speed. Remember the discussion that we just had, which is categories don't exist out in the world. The world is a continuum, but the moment we interact with the world, categories seem to arise. Here's another example of this. There's something about our morphology and the way we interact with the world that causes discrete categories to form. And in this case, they're categories of motion, right? which we call gates. All right, so if I were to put you on a treadmill and ask you to walk, don't run, and I continued to speed up the treadmill, as the treadmill got faster, it would become increasingly uncomfortable for you to walk at those faster speeds, right? The rate at which you, you burn energy increases faster as the treadmill goes faster. For a given speed of the treadmill, it is actually more comfortable for you to start running than it is to walk, right? You can see that in this case here. Right? This is why we tend to prefer certain gates over certain other gates. There isn't a nice relationship between speed and gait. You can see that running here is relatively flat. If we kept turning up the treadmill, that, that line would definitely not stay, stay flat, right? Okay. Similarly, we can have a look at just one gait. So if I, I was to ask you to, I think this is walking in panel B here, walk with, uh, to walk with short, fast steps, or long, slow steps, again, it would feel uncomfortable, right? This exaggerated walking. If you walk with very long strides or very short strides, you use more energy per unit of distance traveled than if you walk at your normal gait, which for most of us is about one step per second, right? One hertz. So we just talked about gates. Depending on the number of legs that you have and your particular morphology, you have more or less gates. Do we have any horse people here this morning? How many gates is a horse capable of? Very 
There's three of them. What are we missing? Cantering. Cantering and running, right? Kind of four and a half, but typically five. No horse people. There's another horse that's actually capable of a sixth gait. There's the Icelandic horse, which is cap capable of toasting. Uh, apologies for my Icelandic, for my poor Icelandic accent. Wait, are those the really tiny ones with the hair? Uh, I believe so, yes. So uh, great, Google, uh, great YouTube videos to watch is go watch Icelandic horses toasting. Don't do it now, but anyways. Uh, horses capable of five or six gates, depending. Um, let's introduce a little bit of terminology. Uh, as we look at uh, legged locomotion in animals and robots, we're going to be interested in the stance phase and the flight phase. So stance phase is there's at least one foot on the ground. In galloping and above, the horse is capable of a flight phase. So there's certain points in time when all four feet are off the ground. <coughs> Interesting historical footnote here. The first uh, the first movie that was ever shot, it was an attempt to try and determine whether horses actually have a flight phase. If you watch a horse running in real life, it's actually extremely difficult to see if there is a flight phase. And so, uh, I forget the fellow's name who captured the first movie, and if you watch it and slow it down, you can see in the freeze frame that there actually is a flight phase in, in horse locomotion. Okay. Uh, a little bit more terminology that's going to come up. We're going to be interested in, for a given animal or robot and a, a given gait, is it statically stable or is it dynamically stable? So static stability is important. Again, remember robustness. This is important. As I'm moving around, can I at any point catch myself, change direction, and do something else? I can if I'm statically stable, and a way to test that is to stop, and if you can maintain your pose, you're statically stable, right? You can stop at any time and hold your own weight. Dynamically stable is the idea that you're in motion, and if there's any perturbation to you, you stumble a little bit, or you're pushed, or there's a puff of wind, you return naturally to that dynamic pattern. There are non-animate objects that also have this property of dynamic stability. What are they? Gyroscopes, Gyroscopes right? You take a, a, a top and spin it very quickly, and it will stay on its point. Even if you touch it, it'll return to the, the vertical, right? Gy gyroscopes have the same property. That's dynamic stability. Again, for robustness, that's, that's pretty important. You'd like to have a dynamic way of moving that even if there's perturbations caused by the ground or the environment around you, you return to your, uh, your stable pattern. Ways of investigating this are based on the polygon of support. So imagine we have a four-legged animal here. We're looking at the left front foot, right front foot, left back foot, and right back foot. So at any point in time, assuming we're in the stance phase, there is one or more feet that are in contact with the ground. Let's say we draw a dot wherever the, the foot is in contact with the ground, and then we literally connect the dots to create a polygon of support. And if our center of mass is inside that polygon of support, we're statically stable, right? It's not going to move outside. That's why when you're walking and you stop, as long as your center of mass is inside the polygon of support drawn by your foot, you're okay. The moment my center of mass goes outside of the polygon of support defined by my foot, I fall over, right? Even with two feet, as long as they're uh, diagonal, I'm creating this polygon of support and I'm, I'm stable. Here's statically unstable, so at this point in time, in this cartoon here, the horse is only touching the ground with its left foot and right foot, and at that point in time, if its center of mass is outside that polygon of support, it's eventually going to start to, to fall over, unless it moves. Okay, so that's animals. Let's switch now to... Uh, to robots. I think everyone has seen the big dog robot. This was a big advance made in the field a few years ago. This is a very dynamically stable robot. No, that's not going to work. Hold on a moment. <clears throat> I 
fuzzy sound that you hear? What is that? Here. It's an engine up here. It's been powerful in the speed of the It's very low with three hundred pounds on its back. You can see that it's dynamically stable, right? It's walking off relatively rough terrain, but it's returning to this gate, this preferred gate that it's going to have. There is another one on just two legs that, that runs, yes. Very sophisticated, but it raises some interesting ethical issues as well. DARPA didn't exceed, though. Sorry? DARPA did say that they don't want them. These? The they're big dog, they're too loud. There's that There's that issue, yes, that's true. That's all right, that's all right that they turned down uh, big dog. <laughs> DARPA may not want them, but, but Google does. Okay. Here is the killer video right here. Over 300 pounds, slips on the ice, and recovers. Right? Don't try this today. Try this on your own. Very sophisticated, dynamic stability. There was a follow-up project to this. All right, everybody see that this is two bipeds and not one quadruped? Okay. All right, so that's, that's big dog for you. <clears throat> okay, back to animals for a moment. So again, uh, like animals, robots have uh, distinct gates. So this is an interesting exa example of how animals uh, actually, wh what aspects of their gait they actually prefer. So in this case, uh, the investigators were working with ponies. They put them on treadmills that they would run then at different speeds, and they would train the pony with positive and negative reinforcement, food or lack of food, uh, to maintain a particular gait at a particular speed. If they, didn't, uh, if they didn't maintain the right gait at the right speed, they didn't get the carrot or what have you. And with enough training, you can get a pony to do this. You can see uh, that for walking, there's a very narrow range of speeds for which that particular gait is energy, most energy efficient. The well here is a little bit more shallow. It's a little bit more forgiving for trotting and even more so for galloping. They then observed ponies in the wild or just moving around uh, on their own and saw that whenever the ponies did walk or trot or gallop, they tended to do so at particular speeds. What were those speeds? The optimum, right? Not surprisingly, like humans, uh, most animals are lazy. We'll move in the way that is most energy efficient given the speed that we want to be moving at. Right? Okay. A beautiful illustration of how animals try and strike this balance between uh, energy and displacement. Right? If you need to move faster or slow, that's fine, but make sure you pick the appropriate gait that minimizes energy at that speed. Okay, so let's switch to robots now. We've got about 15 minutes left, so we'll get partway through this. Uh, the reading for today, uh, I submit for your humble consideration one of my own research papers from uh, a while back. So I was interested in investigating this trade-off between these four aspects of locomotion. And the way we tried to do it in this case 
was to create 10 morphologically distinct robots. So 10 robots that had different body plans, but they all had exactly the same neural network. So the underlying genotype, the number of synaptic weights that we're going to evolve for this neural network is exactly the same for all 10 robots. So I tried to keep everything about these robots the same. Same neural network. They also had exactly the same number of sensors and motors. So if you look carefully at these 10 robots, you'll see for each one of them there are four A's, which are four angle sensors or are proprioceptive sensors. There are four T's, which correspond to the, where I place the four touch sensors in the robot. And there are, eight, uh, there are eight motors that are placed throughout the different robots. Same neural network, same sensor, same motor, same task. Just locomote, move as quickly as you can away from the origin. And the same fitness function. Maximize the distance between the final position of the robot and the origin. OK, we don't have time to set up a betting pool. But if we did, who do you think is going to evolve to travel further? So I'm sorry, I forgot to mention. So then for each of these 10 robots, we did uh, 30 evolutionary runs for each one and looked at the average speed or the average distance traveled by the evolved robots at the end. Uh, given the setup, I said the line. The line, you're, so five or seven? Yeah. OK, I hear a vote for five or seven. Again, if you've read ahead in the reading, don't cheat. What do you think? It's actually not five or seven, so it's all right. Other, other guesses? Ten. Why 10? Because they all have very distinct ability to kind of be a just biped. That's it. So I didn't quite get to a biped here. We have a tripod. OK, I hear a vote for for 10 because it has this swinging. As I mentioned, the fitness function is only selecting for displacement. There's nothing in the fitness function about energy. So it turns out that actually it wasn't 10 either, right? Because 10 is good for energy, but not very good for maximal displacement. We are not the first fastest animals on, on the planet, but we're close to the most energy efficient. Other guesses? OK. Two. Why two? Uh, because it's got the, the quadrupedal motion. So it, it's kind of got the, the shoulder joint. Yeah. So quadrupeds are pretty ubiquitous in nature, right? It's a pretty good solution. It's a pretty good guess. All right, let's carry on, and we'll see who the eventual winner is. So as I mentioned here, remember that each robot has four touch sensors, four angle sensors. We've got a hidden layer in here. I'm not sure whether short-term memory is going to be useful for locomotion, but I put it in just in case. We have our eight motors here, and we have two B neurons. What does the B stand for? You've seen this before. Bias. The bias neurons, right? What does a bias neuron do for you? Why put it in? Imagine one of our robots at a certain time step in the simulation, it's in flight phase. So all four, all four body parts that contain a tuck sensor are off the ground, meaning all four T's are zero. And let's imagine that all four angles are at their default range, right? When the moment you create a joint, the angle is zero. What happens at the, at the motor layer? It doesn't move, right? All the M's are zero. Now, it depends on the hidden layer. It might have a memory of what just happened. But generally speaking, you want to add a bias neuron so that the robot doesn't freeze if there's no sensory information coming in. The bias neuron just always outputs a 1. And then if evolution evolves these weights, it can change how the robot moves if there's little to no sensory stimulation uh, arriving. OK. So all the robots have exactly the same neural network. We evolve them against the same fitness function. What I'm showing you here are a series of footprint graphs. And we haven't seen footprint graphs yet. These are extremely useful for visualizing the behavior of legged robots. So video is ideal. But in lieu of a video, you can create a footprint graph. Another great uh, thing to remember for your final project, for those of you that work on legged locomotion. 
So we've got 10 panels here. Each one corresponds to the best gait evolved for that robot. In each of these 10 footprint graphs, the row corresponds to one of the feet, and each column corresponds to one of the time steps in the simulation. So for each neural network, I dropped it into the robot for 500 time steps. Black pixel indicates that that foot was on the ground at that time step, and a white pixel shows that that foot was off the ground at that time step. Okay, so let's reinforce our terminology. Did any of these robots ma uh, manage to exhibit a flight phase? Five? How do you know? There's a just vertical lines of white pixels at times. That's right. So if you look at five here, there are certain points in time for which there are all white pixels, which means all those body parts were, were off the ground. So we can see that one or a few of them managed to achieve a flight phase. What was this robot down here? You should be able to tell just by looking at the footprint graph. This is the tripod. How did the tripod move in this case before I show you the video? That's it, right? So when you break your leg and you're on crutches, this is basically what it's doing, right? The two crutches go down and the, the middle leg swings forward in, in opposition. You can see certain patterns like the two legs swung or were, st uh, were planted for longer than the third leg that that planted and, and so on. Anybody want to change their bets for which robots did better here based on just looking at the footprint graphs? Remember that the footprint graphs here are telling you nothing about displacement. This doesn't show you how far the robots got, just how they moved. How does how they move give you a hint about how far these things managed to travel? I'm wondering about now. What about nine? Because it has a lot of flight in it. It has a lot of flight, right? So that's probably a good sign. We have a flight phase when we run, and we move pretty fast when we run. Yep. Uh, so three and six. Um, no, wait, three and five. Three and five. Five seems to have kind of like these uh, barred, like as though it's using a pendulum type motion. OK, so you can see some of that going on. So you can see alternation between stance foot and swing foot. You can see that some of these patterns are a little bit more regular than others, right? That's also a, a pretty good uh, hint, right? Things that are moving more irregularly tend to move slower than, th than things that have a very crisp, rep repetitive pattern. Any last bets? Okay. Let's have a look at a few videos here. Let's have a look at the hexapod first. Takes a while to get going, and once it goes, it's not doing too badly. Not going to set any land speed records, but not bad. Let's have a look at one of the quadrupeds. Not bad. A clear gate, right? We didn't select for a particular gate. We just selected for maximizing displacement. Here's the tripod. Walking on its crutches. Kind of stumbled there, but manages to catch itself. And we're done. Okay. 
Okay, let's have a look at one of the one-dimensional worms. I mentioned peristalsis, peristalsis, right? You can see that evolution here has rediscovered at least the rudiments of peristalsis. There's a, there's a, a traveling wave, more or less, towards the front of the robot, which pushes backwards against the ground. But it seems to be hard for it to maintain this, this wave. All right, the worms did not fare very well in this experiment. OK, here we go. So 10 fitness curves, each curve corresponding to one of the 10 robots. Each curve is reporting the average of the best controller in the population at that time. So each, each, uh, each curve here corresponds to 30 separate runs. We took, the, we took the best controller out of the population across those 30 populations at that point and looked at the average displacement or the average fitness of those robots at that time. You can see there's a clear winner circle up there at the top. Robots 6 and 2 and 3, which were which three robots? So 2 and 3, the two, these two quadrupeds, this one didn't do as well, and 6, the hexapod. Right? Robot number 4 should look very familiar to you. This is why you're building robot 4. It tends to work quite well. Okay. And then between those top three, then there was a, a cluster of other robots, and then the worms there, number five and seven, were the clear losers in this experiment. Okay. Given your experience with physics engines so far, and what we've said so far about robots, what is it about these robots that makes some do better than others? Are there specific features of the body that we could point to and measure to use to try and predict how well or how poorly those robots are going to do? What are some obvious candidates? So if I was, I was to say, give me some measurement of these robots, and we'll see if that particular measurement of that robot's body, some aspect of that body, correlates with how well it actually did, what would you give me as candidates? Maybe how evenly its mass is distributed. How evenly its mass is distributed, right? So mass is definitely going to be important somehow. Number of legs. Number of legs, right? So these are the obvious things to try. So the first thing I tried was not to look at mass distribution. I didn't actually look at that. That would be a good thing to look at. I just took the total mass of the robot. So you'll notice that some of the robots are made up of more pieces than others. Each piece has a mass of one kilogram. Uh, so I just it's basically the number of pieces that make up the robot. And so the lighter robots are down here. The heaviest robot, which is made up of 41 pieces, is the hexapod out there. And then I just plotted that average performance that you just saw. And there is a kind of trend here, right? The heavier the robot gets, the worse it tends to do. But there are obvious counterexamples to that trend. So mass is not the only explanation of speed, right? There's some pretty big, heavy animals out there that can move pretty fast. It's not just about mass. Here's number of legs, but I actually did the number of points of contact. So how many, par how many parts of the robot actually came into contact with uh, the ground? So here's our triped with three out here. Here's our three quadrupeds, and here's the two worms out here. And again, we see there is a bit of a trend here. So if you have three, or in our case, two points of contact, you're relatively unstable. Uh, takes a while to evolve the ability to move, and especially to move quickly. Four legs is pretty good. Six legs is pretty good. With more points of contact, like the worms, there's a lot of stuff you have to kind of coordinate to build up, build up speed. So, Whatever the answer is, it's pretty complicated, right? And no one's really figured it out yet. What are all the aspects of morphology, and how do they all combine to make you faster or slower?
Okay, I think we'll stop there for today. We have a quiz due at midnight tonight. Continue to work on assignment six joints, and we'll talk about assignment seven and eight on Tuesday. Thanks very much. Thank you.